So I'm gonna let people know it's back up. All right. There we go. All right, so. Getting right back to it. We have Boutique again. So, Lexi is joining me here today. Thank you, Lexi. And we're going to wrap up the ebook PDF embedding with products and downloadability. So, I'm going to make GCI here, make Bell. Let that compile. Alexi asked if I was planning on switching to GCI 8.2.1 for this project. Um, not for now. I'm going to let other people eat the pain on that first. Then I will. For now, no. Okay, so we have um, uh, Yasuo Devel handling, starting and restarting the web app. Um, it'll make working on the code in some respects a bit nicer. So what we were doing last time is we were implementing um, this endpoint and some of the database models and stuff around that. So, in media, you have directory, um, PDF, screen, and then given an int64, which is a primary key for a product, you can then download it. And the route handles checking for your uh, permissions to download that product. Um, what I'm doing right now is kind of naive and bad. So what I'm doing is I'm just using the byte string IO API to read the file, copy it into memory, and then send it back down the pipe. Not great. Not great. So if we take a look at source handler store IHS, and we look at the type of to content, and we see that it's just a type class that knows how to turn things into the concrete content type. Well, it turns out what it's doing right now is it's just using um, the content type content, and then I think it's uh, I think it's using content source maybe. Regardless, it's using something that goes uh, from a byte string to some kind of content. So the problem is, is that what I really want to do is use something streaming. So I can do that a couple different ways. One is I can construct a content source, and that'll be a conduit source. That was my dog grumbling just now. He's grumpy because I just bumped him with my foot. He's going to get over it. All right. So I can use a conduit source to make this streaming so I don't have to contain the entire contents of the PDF in memory during the entire download. Ideally, I would only read in memory what the user is currently downloading. So content source can do that. I'm pretty certain content file is going to do the right thing as well, though. So given that, what I'm going to do is I am going to try constructing a content file value instead of the byte downloading. So I know that I have a particular file path. So what we're going to do is just say let file path equals that. And then it's going to, you said develop is going to automatically reload on the side here. I wouldn't pay it a lot of mind. Yeah, variable not in scope file bytes. Yeah, I know. Okay, so instead of file bytes, we're going to do content file 
file path, and then this maybe network WI internal file part thing. Um, it's basically just a segment of a file. It has a file part offset, which is an integer by count file size. Uh, I'm just gonna try not specifying that. Leave it nothing. I'll just leave it at that. And see if this works. And survey says. It looks like it worked. So what I'm gonna do now is pull up my account, login, login, whoops. All right. All right, let's see here. Let's find the user that I have. It's the fixture user. If I recall correctly, model fixtures and Chris password. There we go. Update password, sure. Okay. Now we want to go to that endpoint product download. So if I go to model fixtures, I can find the default download I constructed. Dun, 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 dun. It's just should just be one. So we're gonna do two SQL key one key and that's gonna be digital product digital media. And then I'm gonna run dev db, and yeah, it's just one. So download one, so that has to be an, a valid in 64 right there. And then download, uh, oh, it's product download. And that appears to have worked. That worked fine. Timestamps 2017, and that's right now. So that worked out fine. All right, that's done now. So I'm just going to clean up the bits I don't need anymore. So that's going to be that, and I don't really need that at the moment. And do that. Okay. And now I can check that off. So this should make the download streaming. Um, I'm verified, but generally speaking, that's how it works. But if we want to double check, content file, yesod, content file, yesod streaming, pretty certain it does. Yeah, simpler streaming file uh, responses, and it says we could server files, content files, so I'm pretty certain it's. Yeah, use the source. You don't, you aren't limited to content builder. You can use content file or content source. And uh, that takes care of that. So yeah, it's supposed to be streaming. So what I can do now, now that that's closed, I can move on to the next thing. So at the moment, what I'm actually gonna do is a little bit of code review. Joseph uh, put up this PR. That's this guy. And, whoops, page is out of date. 
Alright, so he's working on shopping cart functionality. And what this added looks like a yeah, query view cart checkout cookbook. Alright. So cookbook got deleted there, probably got moved somewhere else. Um, some imports. Looks like it moves some queries around. Separators, get cookbook R is just cookbook view. Okay. Get checkout R is just checkout view. And then looks like Joe refactored the queries to a qu separate query module. Looks good. This I I haven't double checked, but I think this is the same as the previous query. It doesn't look any different to me. Could be wrong about that, but I think that's the case. Uh, user media for product. It's commented out. It may have been before. I don't know. User cart contents. So this is one of the new queries. So I've given a key user, return the digital and physical products associated with that user's cart. Key user. Entity, cart digital, cart physical, if map, buy map, cat maybes, cat maybes. That makes sense. The result would have been um, list of maybe entity, I think. Yeah, so it's got inner join, left outer join, left outer join. I bet he enjoyed writing that query. Uh, on just cart ID, on just cart ID equals physical products cart, digital products cart user ID, cart user, where user ID equals value user key. Yeah, it looks good. Um, what does the tuppling mean? Oh, no, sorry. It's just a tuple of the, of the separate lists. Okay. That's actually kind of convenient, because if I want to handle the way physical and digital products work in the cart, I can do so. I doubt it, but you never know. Okay, select to create user cart. This was another necessity because if they don't have a cart, we need to create one. Then we have add digital product to cart, add physical product to cart, select or create user cart, select or create user cart. So that's one thing I'm double checking here is I'm making certain that the helper that um, either gets an existing cart or creates a new one is used uniformly in anything touching the cart. That's definitely what we want. And then cart digital products just constructs a value there. Insert by cart digital product either exists or inserted. So I probably want to take a look at. So what I usually do when I want to take a look at something for a moment in a GitHub PR, but I don't really want to leave my spot. I'll open the same PR in a different tab, and then I'll just search for the thing I want to look for. So in this case, I'm looking for cart digital product for the insert by. May not even be a thing. Yeah, I think it's just an accessor. But we'll double check. Ramp make GCI. And we'll keep going for now. Oh, I okay, insert by cart digital product. That's just the value that was defined there. Okay. Uh, I need to remind myself what insert by is. Whoops, I didn't want to change my layout there. There we go. All right, T insert by. Uh, I see. Okay. So I'm t guessing it's using the primary on that. Whoops. Cart digital. Um, yeah, I think it's using that unique key. Yeah, persist unique right backend, persist entity backend, base backend. So I think it's relying on the unique key. And then um, either exists or inserted. Not okay. Peer dot just entity card digital product. Allow users to add digital media already present in their libraries. When you were assured, prompted send the media to a friend as a gift in the email. I think we're going to punt on that for now. 
Um, I do want gifting, but um, I need to think about it before we think about adding that. Um, because it needs to cover not just digital media, but also uh, physical media, which is also going to complicate the way addresses are represented. Because right now, addresses are unique to a user. Um, so you can't have multiple addresses per user at the moment. Of course, don't have to save the address to the database for gift purchases, but um, Amazon does, and it's kind of nice if you're in the habit of sending somebody any gifts. You ever use that, Alexi? The address book in Amazon? Yeah. Yeah, I've got like both my parents in there and stuff, and I just send them something. If I see something, I think that um, they would like. And I don't want to have to dig their address out of my email or anything like that. And physical product card. This one's a little bit different, isn't it? I guess because um, yeah, this one looks different. I wonder why this one looks so different. Oh, because of the quantity. Right. So, if it already, if it doesn't already exist, um, he just inserts the entity with a, a quantity of one. If it was already in the cart, then he updates it with an increased quantity. And that's just to handle the fact that, it, you know, if somebody adds the same physical product to their cart twice in a row, then we just bump the quantity. <laughs> Oh, um, I think what Joe is talking about is the physical product part. Yeah, he just pinged me in Slack. So, yeah, that is, in fact, what he's talking about. So he's asking if we can, because right now what we have to do is we have to do a two-step where we get maybe the existing physical cart product, and then if it... Um, if it already exists, we do a separate one where we update the quantity. So he wants to do like an upsert update kind of thing. Um, hmm, I don't know. I mean, you can upsert, but the problem is the quantity increment. So let me, uh, I think, let me check persistent here. So because I've got upsert here somewhere. If I can find it. Uh, con upsert sequel update. What on earth? Class, maybe. Upsert, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to lean towards no on that. You can definitely do stuff with like replacement or upsert kind of things by a particular key. You can do that, like upsert and upsert by and that kind of thing. Um, I don't think you can do an ar a transaction that arbitrarily updates, at least not in terms of persistence. Um, the other way to do it would be to do um, an update set returning. But Escalito doesn't support that either. If you take a look here, update returns unit. So because Escalito doesn't support update set returning, um, you don't have a way to do a kind of optimistic update. Because the other way to do it um, would be to update with an increment operator, which Escalito does support, and then return all the rows touched and then you know if it's an empty set then you just do an upsert right mm -hmm. but uh, you don't have a way of doing that from persistent or escalator so the way you did it uh, Joe the way Joe did it here is pretty much correct
Um, fortunately, in Haskell, we have just a DB monad here. So everything's in the same transaction, so it's perfectly atomic. It's just hypothetically maybe a little less efficient. I wouldn't worry too much about it though. Okay, handler store view cart. Uh, that's just store views, I think. And then checkout Hamlet became store view checkout. That's that is fantastic. I know it's not a big change because what he did was he just took the Hamlet file and wrapped it in the checkout view thing, but um, I I really hate having the separate files because uh, the REPL won't auto-reload the template. You said Devel knows how to do it, but I don't really care. Yeah, and then we've got cookbook view in store view cookbook. That looks fine. Uh, that looks fine. Fixtures got changed so that there would be a cart for the user, and it looks like we're putting a digital product ID and a physical product ID in the fixtures now, so that's going to change. And we've got cart fixtures, digital product fixtures, physical product fixtures. Cool. Yeah, uh, Alexi just told me what Joe said in Twitch. He mentioned that update, kill GCI, load GCI, and reload, stop getting fun. Yeah, that's that's why it's really valuable if you're working via the REPL. That's why it's really valuable to just move your templates into a Haskell module because then everything just automatically reloads and you don't have to kill your GCI session over and over. Um, again, it doesn't matter if you use you so develop like this because it knows when you update the template files, or at least it should. Here, I'll try just changing this file. Yeah, and you see how it automatically reloaded? That's because you so Devel has a special thing in it that tells it about um, special kinds of files and directories. But if you're not using you so Devel, you're out of luck, and I often am not. Uh, you so Devel is actually pretty good for just pure front end work where you're just modifying a template over and over. Um, the problem is when you're doing work that's more kind of REPL oriented, usually database or controller type stuff, and then you want to touch a template like once in the middle of multiple other changes, then you know you start getting a little, little irritated. So it's that interleaving case that really bites you. Um, yeah, the fixtures look fine, uh, this looks fine, this looks fine, so yeah, everything looks pretty much good, um, I think the only thing I'd want changed, and I think Joe already knows, is just get rid of these, uh, hyphen lines that separate the definitions, um, other than that, looks great, he's definitely putting more care into this than I am, alright, so that PR will be good to go as soon as the... CLA lands and I'll just go ahead and assign this to him because he's the one that worked on it. All right. Um, uh, Joe wants to know if we sh if he should leave the comment blocks in. I'm guessing Joe means stuff like that and I found them helpful so I'm gonna say yeah leave them in looks good to me I don't mean uh, I think Joe asked that because I didn't really comment any of my code <laughs> so uh, I don't have anything against comments I uh, I just I generally only comment something that's um, really confusing or dangerous um, I don't I don't use them for to do's or anything like that. I did see that Joe had a couple of things like that, but I don't care if other people do it. It's fine. Uh, especially if it's other people's code, I don't really mind. Okay. So that has been done now. Um the uh the shopping cart stuff or at least it's pretty much done. I may need to you know, I'm gonna have to tie it into the whole checkout process and 
everything else, but and I may need to add some navigation or other things. Um, I know David, the designer, so he's he's the one responsible for actually doing the front end work and making it look like this. Um, he's gonna start on the uh, the nav bar next, I think. So shopping cart stuff will get added to that when it's ready. So what I'm gonna start on next is the user library. Um, I want to be able to see the products I own when I'm logged in. So if we go back to routes. Uh, we do have a library R already. So if we go to source handler store and Lexi pointed out what Joe said in Twitch. So Joe said uh, your stuff was pretty self-explanatory. I mostly leave myself notes. Some days my brain's like a sieve. Yeah, I think mine's like a colander. Uh, even bigger holes than a sieve. Yeah, um, well thank you, Joe. I'm glad it was self-explanatory. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, so that's actually an interesting note. I write notes in a particular way that most programmers don't, which is when I'm debugging. I'll keep a debug log and I'll do it for several reasons. One is so that I can keep track of like one thing after another that I tried, right? And I'll actually organize it into like a kind of loosely hierarchical structure if any of the solutions attempted are interdependent. Like if I have to have, if one has to be true in order for me to try fix two, then I'll actually number it like 1A, right? And then if I start from a different branch and I kind of back off to a different solution that has a different foundation, then I'll start a new top level number. And then every kind of sub attempt within two becomes 2A, two 2B, two so on and so forth. Um, and I do this for several reasons. One is that it makes my debugging a lot faster um, because I for I don't forget what I tried and I might see something I might not otherwise see if I didn't have that little markdown buffer of notes. Another reason I do it is because when I go to actually file the issue is fixed or closed or whatever in uh, you know whatever the issue tracker is, I don't have to try to do a write up from memory. I can either summarize what's in the notes or I can just attach the notes to the issue. And then if my coworkers ever run into it again, they have a very detailed log, which makes their lives easier. And sometimes my coworker is just me six months later. So I like to be nice to my coworkers. All right, so we have git library r. I should probably just take a look at the uh, the template here. So that's just going to be uh, library. Yeah. Okay. Do look here. Yep. Okay. So one thing I'm going to have to deal with here is downloads. I'm going to have to decide how to organize those. I'm not going to worry about it too much for the moment because I want to just get the template moved, but I need to think about listing downloads and stuff and content for that. Um, that template might actually be a little bit involved because it's going to have to be conditional on the kind of content it's listing and I'm going to want notes and copy about different things there. Um, just as a uh, kind of for example, I was working on an EPUB version of uh, Haskell book today and uh, the main um, motivation there was for the visually impaired. Um, somebody raised an issue on our support mailbox, um, that being, here I'll show you which support mailbox I'm talking about. See that little contact link there? If you click that, you can send us an email and that goes to a Zendesk uh, inbox. It's like a support ticket queue. Um, anyway, so someone mentioned that EPUB really works a lot better for their screen reader that reads the text, you know, in whatever application to them. Um, I didn't do an EPUB until recently. I mean, I actually generated one before. It's just it looked bad, and I didn't really have any control over the layout or anything. I think 
it was Apple iBooks in particular that rendered the EPUB in a really bad way. Um, but if you just open it in a web browser or a Linux e-reader like PPUB, this is PPUB, um, it does actually an okay job. Now, the reason the downloads page is a little bit complicated is because I basically want to be able to explain what something is supposed to do, like what it's for. So I want to explain, hey, here's an EPUB, particularly good if you use a screen reader. And, but here's the catch. Um, if you take a look in, oh, I don't have the Lambda Calculus chapter in this version. Hold on. Uh, release, there we go. And then go to here. And, okay, so, um, I know it's really small on the screen, but just take my word for it, there's lambdas here. And the problem is, these lambdas are Unicode, um, and the way the whole expressions are rendered is using MathML, um, which is a web standard, I'm pretty sure. Um, anyway, the format is like application slash tech, so it's actually just reusing the the original LaTeX, as far as I can tell. It's pretty funny. Um, anyway, the screen readers for brow that interact with the browser, they don't support this unless you install some MathML fonts. So I need to include an explanation or a link explaining that situation in the downloads page that says, hey, if you use a screen reader and you want to use the EPUB, please check here if you haven't done that before, that kind of thing. Because I need to explain like, you know, I need to link to these, some accessibility documentation, say, hey, you're going to need to install this. I'd also like to explain things like um, I tried five or six different EPUB readers on Linux. Um, only two things worked well for screen readers. One was actually just decompressing the EPUB because it's just a zip archive or whatever. Decompressing it and opening the files in Firefox because Firefox is pretty good. Um, uh, compatibility of screeners has pretty good accessibility. Uh, Google Chrome does not, uh, pretty much at all. And incidentally, Google Chrome doesn't support MathML either, so there's a second reason not to use it. Um, and the other thing is you have to install the fonts. If you don't install the fonts, it's not really going to work. So when I'm creating the downloads page from the library stuff, I'm going to have to think about how to write that copy and structure it. So if we go to templates, store, library, um, first thing we're going to do is just store views and um, this is going to end up getting changed by um, by Joe's stuff eventually, but I think it's fine for now. So library view isn't really going to take any interesting arguments for now. It's just going to be that, and we're just going to do uh, nav layout. I will answer them in just a moment. Whamlet and Whamlet. Okay. So, excuse me, somebody on Twitch asked if this is server side rendered or a GCJS. That is a good question, but if you know me outside of uh, streaming or anything else, then you know that what the answer is going to be. Um, it's, it's all server side. And I'm going to try to keep it as server-side as I can, and it's probably worth explaining why. Um, I've used, uh, or been a consumer of, depends on how you think about it, but I've used GCJS and PureScript for front-end apps um, with Haskell backends before. And GCJS in particular was really nice as a backend developer because I could just reuse the same types for talking about uh, JSON serialization, deserialization, get that nice kind of type safety for that and reuse. Um, and that was really nice. The problem is, is that both PureScript and JCS generate relatively large uh, artifacts of JavaScript for the browser to download. PureScript's a little bit leaner and it has 
it's it compiles faster. There's some other niceties about PureScript compared to DCGS, but ultimately it's not worth it. And I don't really like single page applications that much. I don't find they actually make my life better in typically. Like a lot of single page applications in my experience could be like 95% a pure static web app. And when I say pure static, I'm sorry, I don't mean purely static. I mean, it's still like a dynamic web app where you have like a server, you know, generating the page. But I mean, in the sense of you don't have JavaScript generating the, the document content. 95% um, of the app most of the time could just be, you know, statically generated web page, mostly just HTML and CSS. And then that other 5% of the time, you could just write like a one-off JavaScript widget and just get it done. Um, are there applications this isn't true of? Yes. Some things do need clever JavaScript interactivity and that kind of thing. Um, that's not most applications I've worked on. And I've worked on consumer slash user facing web apps uh, quite a bit. And it's just not necessary. I mean, as a case in point, on the side, um, I have Slack running, which runs Google Chrome to run a chat application. Um, if I check, um, htop on my server, irssi is using, oh, 1.1% memory of a 512 meg server. So, you know, that's like five, six megs of RAM to run IRSSI, which is an IRC chat application. Slack on my desktop uses hundreds to thousands of megabytes of RAM. Um, this is entirely because it's a JavaScript application that needs a web browser host. That is disgusting. Um, and actually, if you care about that sort of thing, it's actually really bad for the environment too. It's killing your laptop's battery life. It's making your desktop use more power. It is gross that we've gone that route with applications. Most stuff can just be a static web page. Case in point, my blog, there's no JavaScript. It's just static content, it's really fast. Why is it fast? Because it's just HTML. All right, so that rant out of the way. Go back to porting web view, library view, sorry. And we got a suggestion from the uh, Twitch. Same person that asked about server-side render GCGS. Stream idea, you saw a crud example from end to end. Um, yeah, that's a reasonable idea. Um, I've got a couple ideas for open source applications I could work on, which would make it easier to dive into SOAD apps by just having a working example. Um, one I worked on with Alexi was actually this app idea for Cards of the Comrades, but part of the reason we uh, stopped working on it was actually because the uh, the prospect of writing a fair, relatively heavy duty front end app was pretty disheartening because it was the sort of thing that would actually, you know, not, not necessarily need it, but definitely benefit a lot from it because it would be an interactive game. And uh, I don't know about Alexi, but I didn't want to do it that much right then and there. Maybe in the future we'll pick it back up. All right, so we're going to go to Lore Pub Boutique, get RMF, template store, library, Hamlet, there we go. And then go back to store, and we're going to change it to library view. Yes, 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 store.dump, store slash library dot Hamlet doesn't exist anymore. I know that. Thank you. Okay, reload, it works. It's one nice thing that you said develop. I don't have to manually reload anything in GCI, it just kind of goes. So that's done now. Okay, so what I need to do now is I need to actually make this um, dynamic. So the first thing is just I need to make a database action that pulls somebody's uh, products. I think user digital product suffices. So the first thing is you have to be logged in to use this endpoint. If you're not logged in, you need to log in. So require user suffices for that. Um, we're going to use 
user digital products. Now it expects a constraint here. Um, you can see it right here. It constrains on entity digital. Uh, it takes entity digital media as a parameter and it generates SQL query. I don't want any constraints on it for the moment because I just want to get a list of every product they own. So since SQL query is a monad or applicative as the case may be, we can just do pure unit. And then it takes a key user, so that's user key. And then we're going to do run db user products save and we'll see if that I'll actually just start loading it in GCI. I don't want to wait for figuring out whether or not Devel loaded. And it failed. Oh yeah, because I didn't use the do syntax. Alright, now it failed on type. Oh right, because I have to const the the argument out. Alright, hold on. Uh, const peer reload and that worked all right so I'm just gonna reformat that a little bit all right so now the user products are in scope and what I'm gonna do is I'm this is a list of digital media yeah we'll, we'll reword that to user media because it's actually what it is. It's not actually the digital products, it's the media. And now what we'll do is take a list of entity of digital media and we are now going to mangle this template a little bit and we'll just create a div class row. Wow, I I don't actually know what all this is for. That's David's wheelhouse. For all, uh, let me look at info, digital media. So title, file name, content type, product. I may need to pull in uh, product and stuff for the cover page, but for now I don't really care. I'm just gonna dump R. And I want a T show R reload. All right, too few arguments. That's because I didn't give it user media reload. And it's done. As soon as Devel comes back up. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. All right. And there we go. So this is a quick and dirty way to test that we successfully pulled my library. And I'll just blow it up a little bit. So yeah, that looks fine. So current problem is we actually need the um, the digital product for that. I'm pretty certain. Digital product to be able to describe the data about the uh, um, media specifically. So the title for digital media is actually specialized to the file. You can see how it says Haskell book screen formatted. We don't want to list every single format of the book, right? So we have a few options here. Um, one is we can actually just make, we can basically get rid of digital media. And we can just get rid of the model entirely and just make all media, digital media associated with a product, just a zip file. And then there's just a file name for the zip file for that product. And that's basically it. Like that's, that's the easiest way to just cut this Gordian knot. Um, another way to do it is to walk up the database query from digital media and then basically what we would do is we parameterize the, pro is projection the right word? Pr 
projection of the rows, maybe? I don't know. I don't know the exact term for this. But basically, we give it as arguments um, all of the data we're joining on. And we give it the option of deciding how that stuff gets returned. So it'd be like some uh, projection P or whatever that's called. And then we would give it, you know, P, digital media, uh, digital product. And then it decides what it returns and what's it, what it keeps. And then you'd have to change the type here to reflect the fact that whatever this function we took returns, that then becomes the type there. Um, so that's the couple routes we can go with that. Uh, let me delete that. All right, there we go. So let's see, what do you think? Change all the digital media to just a zip file associated with the product. Um, Gumroad gives you options. Um, hold on. So I think it does let you download the zip file. So the problem with the zip file approach is that I don't have a way to talk about and describe each kind of digital media. So it makes it a little bit indirect as to um, how things like, hey, there's an EPUB. Well, I can't say that about every single product. Some products are just gonna be videos, for example, right? So that's a little bit of a problem. Um, it also doesn't let me do contextually aware advice or explanation of the media. So I can't say if product has, uh, you know, EPUB media, then so on and so forth. Um, I don't think most companies do anything interesting with this. I think basically you either get a zip file of everything or they give you a pretty dumb file list. And I think that's about it, generally. So, hmm, okay, let's think about this. Oh, yeah, uh, just to make certain. Um, Alexi, what, did you have an opinion? Um, nah, I think it's the right thing. Uh, Alexi suggested having like a, you know, separate download for each file and then give them an option of downloading a complete zip file. Um, I'm not going to do the zip file for now. I'll just do individual files just so I don't have to figure out how to handle, um, I don't, I mean, among other things, I don't want to have to figure out how to generate a zip file in memory in the server. And if I don't want to do that, the easiest way to solve it is to actually just zip up all the files and then put them in the media directory separately and then create a kind of meta media thing that says, hey, this is the zip file for everything. Um, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to risk those things getting out of sync. So I'll just list all the digital media on a separate page for that product. And from there, the user can choose to uh, um, download stuff. So what I'm going to focus on then is I need to get the list of digital products they own, not um, the media. So there's a couple ways to handle this. Um, I think what I'm going to do is what am I going to do? Well, one thing I can do is I can change this to a left adder join. Um, because basically the problem is that the naive way of doing this is to do like that. And it's workable, but it's not ideal. 
Um, can you tell me why, Alexi? Do you know why? Okay. So basically the problem is, is that, and it's not that big of a deal, but it is a little bit annoying. I'm basically duplicating the uh, digital product value. I'm duplicating it for each tuple, right? And what I really want is I want a unique mapping of digital product, digital media. I think the code in Ad Shopping Cart, he had a left editor, yeah, he had a left editor join from cart to digital products and then from digital, cart digital products, cart digital, cart physical products. And then he was able to just return a tuple of two separate lists, um, which is closer to what I want, certainly. Um, and then he just joined on card ID to the card physical products, and you'll notice he used a different operator and adjust on the card ID and all that to deal with the fact that the um, data might not exist. So, let me think here. Uh, so, I think the easiest way to do this is. I'll I'll probably end up merging it and refactoring it later, but I'm just going to keep this dumb. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate some of the code. And we're going to have user library. We're not going to have a constraint function. We're just going to have key user. And then I'm going to copy this whole query down. And there we go. And then we're going to do left outer join from digital product to digital media. And then digital product to digital media is going to be, I'll just use this code as a reference just. And then it's going to be equals equals question mark. And that's done. And then digital product, digital media. Okay. The rest of that should be fine. Just need to get rid of the constraints thing. And then reload. Uh, it's not gonna. It's not gonna be that. It's gonna be tuple entity digital product, digital media. Whoops. Um. There we go. Oops. There we go. Reload. And it's mad. What is it mad about? Uh, actual type, left editor join. Couldn't match type, maybe. Entity, digital product, maybe. Okay. So that's even better, actually. So it's a list of digital product with maybe entity digital product. Well, that's not quite what I want, is it? I mean, it does reflect the fact that um, a digital product might not have a media, a digital media associated with it, which actually, come to think of it, seems kind of wrong. I should make a foreign key constraint for that, but whatever. Um, so the current type is actually this. That's that right now, I think. I'll just reload it to see if that fixes it, but I think it's mad about other things at the moment. Oh yeah, it's mad. All right, that's fine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kill the type signature for the moment. Um, map, what I want is a map of digital product to digital media, and that's a list. And that's what I really want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this back to an inner join, because I really don't want to grab anything that doesn't have digital media like that. And we're going to shove this down a level. So this is user library undefined. 
user key is going to be prime. So this is the base set. Um, and this is going to be tuple list tuple entity digital product entity digital media end tuple close reload still mad about something couldn't match type SQL expert any digital media with SQL expert okay why is it mad hmm, let me see here Let's select. Oh, hold on. Mm hmm. 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 I'm not doing that right. Cat maybes. Well, that's why there wasn't any maybe in there. That makes sense. I don't have to worry about the maybes though. I do wonder though why it's mad about this specifically. It's column four, column two. SQL for any digital media. It's line 17. I don't think that's the right error. Line 17. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, whoops. I was looking at the wrong thing. It was just complaining about user digital products, not user library. Okay, reload. Yeah, load of fun now. <laughs> okay, so now we have user library, so we're going to do do user library, user key, and products media. So this is a list of tuples. So what we want to do is, so we have uh, import qualified data dot map as M. Undefine that out. Reload t dot um, insert with. Okay, so I wrote a blog post once about a this. Yeah, this this code refactoring with point free style demo with update map. All right, so here's the deal. Um, the code this uses is going to be inspiration for me. So you see map.insert with plus um, what I want, and probably this actually already exists in containers, and I think of it. But basically, what I want is um, either ins if, if the digital product isn't already in the map, then and this reminds me, I'm going to need um, EQ ORD show. Let's see how that shakes out. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. I need ORD to be able to use it as a key in a map. Okay. Um, if it doesn't exist, insert it with, uh, you know, a single digital media in a list. Otherwise, you need to append the digital media to the list. So in this blog post, I showed you how to kind of slowly refactor your way from one way of constructing or updating maps to the other. And it does look like I was using map.insert with. So I'll just go ahead and write out map. OK. And then we're going to do map.insert with. And 
you take an A to A to A and a K and let's test that map.insert with and then we're just going to do monoid key zero value like uh, blah and then map.empty couldn't match expected type oh why is it why is it mad uh, oh insert with there we go and then map.insert with monoid zero woot dollar sign and yeah that does the right thing all right so let insert map equals and kv uh, m kv um, list v m and then we're going to fold insert map map dot empty products media um, we're just gonna get these as a tuple so let's just do that and that's a uh, uh, fold L prime a element mono a so it's a uh, uh, map key value fold L prime return reload failed could match type entity digital media with digital media ah right uh, fair enough does entity have a pass through or instance it seems to wait no I didn't put ord no entity does an entity have an ord instance uh, yeah seems to so we'll just go ahead and entity social media okay reload hey that worked all right so now we have a database action that produces a map of entity digital product to entity digital media okay cool beans all right so now what I need to do is map dot keys so the irony of it is I'm actually only going to grab the digital products for the actual library page so this is where we factor it out the projection function so um so Lexi asked I want to do I want to build the user library into a map um maybe I may end up being I don't actually use that I thought I did but I don't actually want to put the downloads for each product in the library page. So I really just need the digital product um, data for now. The only reason I could think that I would want um, the media is so I could list what format each product supports. Does that make sense? So instead, what I, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this download link, I'm gonna make it go to a product specific download page, and then you're just gonna get one product from the database and then grab all the, the media associated with it. So, so this wasn't well motivated. Oh well, that's okay. That's how we learn. All right, so <clears throat> we're gonna just do the quick like refactoring thing here so p 
digital product, digital media, and what's the type of K? It says the type of K. Uh, couldn't match expected type SQL expert any digital product. Okay, so the problem is it expects it expects that particular type because of how we're using it in user library. So we're gonna comment that out, reload, see if we okay. Expected type with type variable K. That's interesting. Oh, whoops. Um, that's why it thinks that. Because we're doing that, so yeah. No. Okay, there we go. All right, so SQL expert entity, SQL expert entity K. Okay. Um, pretty tired of typing this out. So. E SQL expert entity E and that's gonna be SE digital product. We'll call it SQL E. SQL E digital product function SQL E digital media. And that's gonna be um, it's gonna be SQL EK or just K? Uh, it's just K. So we'll call it P, P, reload, and it's complaining that it could not deduce SQL select P, P. Yeah, that's fair enough. So SQL select E. Oh, it needs it for P, not for E, right? Yeah. Uh, database, SQL to internal SQL, SQL select to P. Yeah, okay. <sighs> okay, so given some function SQL select uh, P, P, and we need to import. So turn on SQL, reload, that worked. All right, so now what we can do is we can pull it like this. So user library prime, and we're just gonna do const for the projection because it returns the first thing. And the first argument is digital product. So that's all we care about. And then we pass it user key. And this is now going to be user products. User products. Uh, digital product. Products. Products. Reload. And it's complaining that could match type SQL expert entity digital product with any digital product. Uh, let me see here. Library view digital user products. Oh, that's not the right thing. Hmm. Mm, right. Okay, so the problem here is the monad. Um, what I need to do is make it return MP reload SQL expert. And then I need to make the function that was const that needs to be 
Um, return const, I think. Return.const. That's, uh, I don't want to reload. I don't want to get the type. Import dot. That's uh, a to m of b of a. So what we want is return import dot dot import dot dot. Yep, that's better. Double composition monad m a one a m a one because we're just dropping the a and we want monad a one. All right, so that was the right. We want to do. Uh, There we go. Whoop. All right, now we have to solve the other problem. So, couldn't match type M with SQL query. Yeah, it's just a SQL query monad. So, SQL query, reload, still mad. Couldn't match type um, 118. SQL expert, I need to pray. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the SQL select is doing this. I think that's the problem. I could be wrong. So. Alright. Could not deduce SQL select. Uh, I've done this before. Um, info, single select, import, database is Toledo, database is Toledo, internal SQL. There we go. All right. What are these instances? Uh, instance, SQL select. SQL expert to, yeah, okay, so I'm going to say SQL expert P to P, reload, oh, still mad, all right, could not match type P with SQL expert P, yeah, I, I know, um, hmm, P is a rigid type variable bound by user number prime. Were those instances not SQL select? SQL select. Oh, you know what? Uh, hold on. SQL select prime prime, SQL expert maybe entity A, maybe A, okay. All right, all right. So I, so Alexi asked what I'm trying to fix, I think. So um, I am dealing with this type class, SQL select, so it's the class for mapping results that come from SQL query into actual results. Um, you can think of it as a, uh, a result row parser. Um, a simpler form of this, if you want an example, would be PostgreSQL simple, I think. Let me show you the, the they have a class for this. Uh, I see this from row class where they have, wait, where's the method? Where's the method? From row, row parser A. And a row parser is, where is it? Where is it? Bastard. Uh, row parser here. Um, yeah, reader T of row, state T, column conversion, A. Um, that's not super helpful. Row C int, okay. The point is, it takes like a, a, a tuple of persist values. So a persist value can be 
attacks to byte string and n64 double yada yada yada. So you've got a list of persist values, right? But that's not the representation you want to work with. You want a record. Um, you don't want the list of persist values, right? So you want to turn this into, say, a digital product. Um, SQL select is an instance for looking up the means of doing that, basically. Um, so if I go back here, you see how SQL select it understands how to turn a, B, C into R, A, R, B, R, C for a tuple, like that, because that's obvious, right? Um, but you also notice it knows how to select um, SQL expert entity A. Oh, it needs a persist entity. Okay. All right. So we need persist entity E. Yeah, persist entity E. SQL expert entity E. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm just trying to line up the, uh, the constraints so that I can parameterize over the uh, uh, class of possible things my thing jigger can return. And that's not going to help. <laughs> Could mesh type entity SQL expert entity with SQL expert entity digital product. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Maybe delete that. No. Could not deduce persistent entity SQL digital product. SQL expert entity digital product. SQL expert entity digital product. And it's complaining about brackets. Rightly so. Could not deduce persistent entity SQL expert entity digital product. Yes. That's because it's not a persistent entity. All right. Entity E. Good mesh type, SQL expert. Could not do SQL select, SQL expert, and DE from select. So these are SQL expert entity. That's SQL expert entity. This is supposed to return SQL query SQL expert entity. Hmm. SQL select SQL expert and the E and the E. I actually have types in this list somewhere that make this a lot less annoying. Uh, could not deduce. Okay. Uh, don't I have an info DB val? DB val, throw that in there for giggles. Didn't really help anything. Dun, 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 dun. Could not do SQL select, SQL expert entity E, P. P, P. I need to use the same type throughout. Dun, 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 dun. Entity E, there we go, that was it. So I had two problems here. I was using the wrong type variable, it needs to be the same one throughout. And I wasn't making the entity, I wasn't lifting the type entity, uh, type constructor out. It's not part of the type variable. It's just an explicit bit of structure. Okay. Um, I'm going to enter to force a rebuild here on you. So develop. And this is now parameterized. 
if a little bit annoying. And I think I'm going to add to the model.hs. Where's dbval? Model types. Um, and I can't think of a reason I shouldn't just add SQL select, SQL expert, entity val, entity val, if some situation comes up that this doesn't work for, I will deal with it. All right, so reload, oh, not in scope, SQL expert, so we're going to add to types, we're going to add that bad boy. All right, that's loading now. Everything loaded. All right, go back to store, go to SQL select. All right, let's see if I can simplify that to dbval e. Save, reload, yes I can. All right, we've now narrowed that down to dbval e. So the next thing is I am going to go ahead and save the SQL E, SQL E, SQL E, and SQL E, there we go, reload. All right, that's now substantially cleaned up. All right, cool. So if we want to rewrite this, what we need to do is pass it tuple um, return dot dot tuple. think. No, it needs to be SQL expert tuple. That's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah, it couldn't match type tuple SQL e digital products. Yeah, 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 okay. All right. So I'm getting two arguments. Prod med. Um, except these are SQL expert entity, so I want to info SQL expert SQL expert Wow All right, data where info functor It'd be nice if I could just grep this. There's SQL query. That being the dog in the background. Uh, okay, prod med return prod med. All right, should be basically the same thing. I'm gonna try it anyway. Okay, reload. Hmm, yes. Oh, I, I think I see the problem. Um, I would have to attribute Yeah, it's not entity E0. So it's trying to, yeah, there's several problems with doing it this way. Or, well, the current way I'm doing it. So the problem right now is that this returns list of entity E, right? But I'm not returning a list of entities. I'm returning a list of tuples. 
So I would have to lift out the type constructor and do some annoying stuff to make that work. So I'm not going to do it for the moment. All right, reload, that works. Um, where's the library? There it is, 500. Ratio, integer, types, and compatible. Well, that's a good error to get. All right. SQL type, money. Well, it appears not. OK, so we're going to, no, I need, I need GCI for this. OK, so I'm going to kill Devel. You just need to shut up Devel. There we go. And is there anywhere else this occurs? Looks like no. I'll remove it from here just so I don't mistakenly load it. And we're going to load migration. Nah, fixtures. All right. Mm hmm. Joe just said in the chat that he just got this error. So I'm fixing it for him now. Okay, run dev db. Um, truncate all tables. Yeah. So uh, run dev db. Truncate all tables. And then run dev db dump migration. Oh, not the type. Or ultra table, digital products, column price, type numeric. All right. Done. Insert fixtures. Done. Load source handler store. That I just bring Devel back up. Get that running again. And as soon as that comes back up, we'll uh, give it a look. All right, so note to self, Postgres SQL type money is not compatible with fixed D2. Let me take a look at that. What's, uh, what is it using, 10.2 for that? Where'd that go? Where's the 10.2? 12.2, uh, yeah, numeric 12.2, okay. Okie doke. Reload. Done. All right. Haskell. Okay. Digital product. Digital product price. Digital product title. So now I need to associate this cover image with the static image. All right. Well, those e-tags aren't going to last long. All right. Um, LS static image. Half of programming, half of almanac. Um. Yeah, the simplest way to do this is to just store the file name. If I want to be clever, I just store a prefix and then append stuff. So this is going to be digital product, price, cover, prefix, text, And that's actually not just the digital product. Physical products have that too. Cover prefix and then model fixtures. Um, make products 
physical product, digital product, make ebook. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna change make ebook, and it's gonna take a list of. This is just for the media, so I don't need that. I just need the cover prefix as a separate argument. So text, and then make digital product cover prefix. Make digital product, cover prefix, cover prefix, cover prefix, make ebook, cover prefix is Haskell programming, like that, reload, it succeeded, cool beans. So now what I need to do is, I'd still like to use the static functionality, but I can't do so safely. Um, Cause right now we're taking advantage of the fact that I've got, let me go to the view and I'll show you. So if you take a look here, you'll see that it uses the at and then curly and then static R and then the reference and this is um, a static reference that exists at compile time. Uh, these identifiers basically get populated by the build and the template Haskell basically finds everything inside static and then it turns something like static image Haskell programming.png it turns it into that this thing it just turns everything into underscores basically image underscore haskell underscore programming underscore png um i need to pull this dynamically from the database so that's not going to work um i think you sewed has a way to create unsafe references maybe um let's find out Static. Static. Produce a default value of static for the given file folder. It does not have index files or directory listings. Static files' contents must not change. That's probably for the e tag and stuff. Hmm. That's interesting. Static files map. Static files. Maybe uh, info static r route static info static. Because if I can, what's the type of image underscore Haskell programming? Static route. It's just uh, data instance route static, static route, list of text, list of text to text, text and text. Oh, excuse me. Hmm. Yep. Um, static route, image, Haskell programming, and then an e tag. That's perfect. So all I need to do is construct this with a valid e tag. Let me see here. Um, where's store? Um, user products and I want to generate a static route so digital product static route get cover image 
and digital product. That's going to be static route image cover prefix appended to PNG. And now I just need to figure out the e tag. E tag. All right. So let e tag equals undefined in reload variable not in scope cover oh um digital product cover prefix bring that down all right yeah all right so i just need to figure out where it excuse me, gets the e tags from. Same mistake files, but doesn't append an e tag to the query string. All right, we're just gonna have to look at the code, I think. Tag, tag, hash lookup, cached e tag lookup. Okay. E tags used to be part of the URL, cached e tag lookup, the vel. Hmm. Mm hmm. Um, e tag look up. Okay. Whoops, it's coming from WAI. All right, we're going to skip e-tags for now. Um, I can do them, but I don't care that much right now about the caching behavior, but I will go back and fix it. So it's just going to be that for now. Whoops. And then what I want to do is I want to um, I'm going to move that down to views. There we go. And then what I'm going to do is T show R entity. I don't need the key. I just need R. And then we're going to get cover image R. And then we're going to wrap and add around that. And that's going to be image class equals image responsive source equals the get cover image deal save reload oh it's mad why is it mad could match type app with static hmm right because it has to be Whoops. Hmm, could match type app with static. Has to be route. Widget T. Okay. Hold on. Whoops. Mm, route static, static route, route, whoops, data instance route static equals static route, um, mm, okay, it's, um, Route app static r dollar sign. Okay, so to explain what's going on there, you're not allowed to attribute. Um, so when I use this uh, at and then curly, what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, this is a route for this app, right? And that means that it needs to know that 
the route I'm using is something from here. So normally the static assets get generated using this. And then the way you construct a valid static R is by using the little static R identifier thing, right? And then when we look at the value, it's static route, da 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 da. But what I forgot was the little static R in front of it, right there. That's all. So I changed it to route app so that it understands, yes, this is a route for this application. And then I just put the data constructor for static R in front of it. And then it's fine. All right, we're going to look at it again. And now it's complaining about digital products cover prefix does not exist. Yeah, fair enough. I am boned up. Run dev db reset database. Um, column doesn't exist. I need to run dev db. Let me just create a helper for this because this is annoying. Reset database. So what I want to do is um, I want to run the migrations in between. So uh, run migrations, reload, run dev db, migrate database. It's good. Reload. Hey, look at that. We are now dynamically loading a cover image. Our next problem is dimensions. Dimensions, dimensions, dimensions. Okay. Um, so, why is this one not crazy? I guess I just need to put it in the correct place, but. Wow, that is horrendous looking. Okay. Um, this is Haskell programming, Haskell book for beginners, works for non programmers, experienced hackers alike. So I'm probably going to need that headline. So go back to model. And then digital product is going to have tagline text. Physical product, we won't throw a tagline on it. And then cover prefix, tagline, tagline. Lexi's heading out. Thank you for working with me, Lexi. Appreciate it, as always. Tagline, text, tagline, make ebook, and then. That's where we put that. Reload. Run dev db, migrate database. Done. And now that that's done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to start actually rewriting the template to use the database contents instead of this little like ghetto debugger thing. So what we're going to do is this is currently kind of a grid. I can't really do anything about how that's laid out. So I'm just going to dump this markup over here. Just trying to get that out of the way so I can focus on the one thing I'm implementing. And then how are these, what's each product? Each product starts at call SM6. So for all entity R at digital product dot dot products and then we're just gonna move all this up one two one two and we are going to use that right there so I use the cover image from the database 
and then we're going to change product name to use digital product title. Oh, got to put the little variable thing around it like that. And I'm actually going to just change all these to twos. A little bit easier to keep track of that way. And then this needs to be changed to use the digital product timeline. And I'm not dealing with that yet. Load, reload, worked. Well, no, different part of it worked, but I think it's going to work anyway. OK, reload. And there we go. That's actually pulling my library from the database. It's not um, it's not a fixed template anymore. I do need to work on the download page next, but this does basically work. Pretty cool. Okay, so we are going to what are we going to do here? Delete that. And let me see here. That's pretty much done. So I'm going to go to routes and I need uh, I need a download page for a product. So product download Product download store get product downloads product downloads get product downloads and it's gonna be nav library view empty list for now excuse me and that's just to get things kicked off that's not really intended to be final or anything just a stub and then what that'll let me do is if I go back to views I can then change this download link to um, Routes, uh, whoops, I do need the product ID there. So I don't want download file, because that's actually describing digital media. Hmm. In 64, download, so we're going to change this to media. Download media R. And then... There we go. Go back to store. Change get download product R to get download media R, because that's really what it's doing. It's just downloading media. Okay, reload. It's complaining. 46. Oh, right, because product. Downloads now takes an int64, which is the digital product key. There we go. Reload, and then it works now. Okay. So I'm going to check in what I have so far and call that issue completed. And I'm going to check with Joe to see if we can finish up his, uh, his PR. So that's all for me today. Thank you, everyone. And uh, hit me up on Twitter or Slack if you have any questions. Thank you, everybody.